on 9-11, I went to work uh, as a normal day. My husband um, was a New York City firefighter and he was at work. Um, so when I got up, I was uh, alone in the house, took the dog out and I went on to work. It was about 5.30 in the morning. And um, I'm an ICU nurse and went right into a very critical patient who I was extremely busy. It was, I was only allowed to have that one patient that day because it was such a busy, um, uh, critical patient. And about um, when the first tower was hit, one of my colleagues came to me and said, and told me, but I was so engrossed in taking care of the patients, I was kept working and then it dawned on me that my husband could be there. So that was my first heart sunk of the day. And then when the, and I knew he would be one of the first to do. Um, I had to stay in my work mode to take care of the patient. So I, continued on and when it came to the second tower i was extraordinarily concerned that my husband was there so it was um it was so um surreal um but on the other hand uh, as a hospital we just we had to prepare for what we thought were going to be um, patients. So we were doing a lot of manipulating in our unit to try to figure out how we can assist because we knew we were going to get transfers in. So um, I, I just kept working and that gnawing thought of, okay, you know, I hope he's okay. I hope he's okay. And um, you know, I didn't really have any time to see any footage. I had no time to watch it in real time. So it was probably around um, 1.30 in the afternoon and my previous manager was walking down the hall and I could not read her face. And it was very much that I thought she was going to tell me some horrible news. So um, the first thing she said to me was, the FDNY just called, my heart sunk again, and they said, uh, Roy's alive, but we don't know what condition he's in. So when I, um, you know, my patient was so sick, I had no choice. I just kept in work mode. And it wasn't till about 3.30 that my in-laws called me and told me they had spoken to him. Because as everyone knows, that day we couldn't connect because of the phone systems. So even though we would try, we weren't connecting. So it was about 3.30 and that's when I really knew he was alive and um, not severely injured. So the next, um, he did not come home that night. I went home, but because I worked in um, ICU and I had trauma experience, I went down the next day to, to help. So um, I went down, um, you know, crossed the George Washington Bridge. They weren't letting anybody in except I was very determined and I wanted to be there. Um, unfortunately, I worked at a MASH unit that was right by the Millennial Hotel. We did not see any survivors of the, uh, yeah, not no survivors of the uh, collapse, but we did take care of some of the injuries that the firefighters and police officers and rescue workers and and to be honest with you, I think I did more mental health support that day than any other, but um, it really was a very surreal um, situation because Roy was on the pile working 
and I knew the dangers and he knew the dangers of me being down there. So we were communicating um, by phone when we could and both of us were wanting to be there because that's just what rescue workers and healthcare providers do. Um, it was, um, there's a lot of the day that I truly blocked out of that day um, because I really was so um, focused on taking care of the patient because that was my priority, even though, because I had, knew I had no control over what was going to happen. Um, and I also knew that I knew so many fire, my, firefighters, you know, childhood, you know, friends and family. So I just, you know, I mean, when my husband went to his 25th memorial service, I just said, yeah, you can't. It's just, you know, to know 10 people that have perished from that day that you uh, actually knew and then the peripheral damage and heartache. Sadly, as we know, the community knows 9-11 didn't end on 9-11, and it certainly didn't in your family. No, it, it did not. Um, you know, sadly, Roy was in the dust cloud. Um, he literally just got out of the building, um, and he subsequently... Um, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and uh, fought for five years, but he succumbed uh, to a very painful death, I have to say. And when was that? Um, he uh, died in, um, interestingly enough, um, 1 9 11. That was his, yes. Oof. And you told me that one of the most difficult things besides the physical illness, was the PTSD that everyone who was down there suffered, but, but of course the FDNY and the NYPD partic and the EMS particularly so. Um, and, and Roy was a very um, strong and imposing person. He was, uh, you know, the, the guys really looked up to him. Like if, you know, Roy can survive, you know, like, you know, and if Roy couldn't survive, like, what does that mean for us? Like, that was the general feeling. Um, he did suffer from post-traumatic stress. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that we talked about it, but he had nightmares. He called me on the George Washington Bridge. He was in, stuck in traffic, like, shortly after 9-11 and was, like, panicking. Like, I have to get off this bridge. I have, to, And that was so outside his wheelhouse it really was he was the type where you know we used to go camping and i was like not afraid of bear because i knew roy would take care of it you know like it was you know that was the kind of guy he was so to see him torn emotionally to that level was really heartbreaking he didn't show it you know he really kept you know kept a but it it was a it was a really really challenging time for him. You know, nightmares, waking up in the middle of the night. Um, and the guys don't talk about it. You know, they don't talk about it because it's not manly or, you know, so, um, so they hold it in and they bottle it up. And, you know, that, that spills out onto, you know, their lives, you know, and, it, and so many guys are, and, and women today, you know, they're just, they're still suffering, you know, they're still suffering. And, um, you know, it's 20 years later and, you know, almost 20 years later and it's still present in so many people's lives, people that live down there, residents, you know, I, I can't tell you how many of my friends have like their firefighter wives whose husbands have cancer. So it's never ending for the commute, the 9-11 community, whether, you know, I had 
people I knew that died on 9-11 and I'm still friends with those wives. And then, you know, and then my new uh, community that I, that we have um, uh, become connected because of 9-11 and the suffering that you see is really very sad. It's very sad. How is your health, Trish? Um, it's interesting. I have, um, I, I have asthma and um, I was hoping not to cough during this, um, you know, this interview because I, I do have, I do take medication. Um, I do have to admit I have, I, I am followed by my own physician, but I probably should be part of the um, World Trade Center because I'm a statistic you know, intellectually, I know that. So um, that is, um, but I am, I definitely have uh, physical after effects. I'm so sorry. Um, is there anything else you want to add? No, I, I think that um, I just, I just want to reach out to the 9-11 community and just, um, you know, it's we're in this situation together. And um, if anyone is out there and is not uh, connected and was um, touched by 9-11, please reach out because there's so many resources and you can't do this alone. And you do need to talk about it. And even if you were there and you are still healthy, God forbid you get sick in the future. There are things you need to do now to prove you were there because the Victim Compensation Fund is in place for 70 years and you can get free health care for life with the World Trade Center Health Program. There are 400,000 people in this community and most have not registered. It's important. Thank you so much, Trish. Thank you, Shelley, for all you do.